that your heart's desire tonight. Come on, lift your voice and sing it with us tonight. That's my heart's desire. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Revival 2022. And we are glad that you are with us on tonight. I am excited that um, one of our members of our team, worship team, Brother John, will lead us in worship tonight. Won't you stand and worship as we prepare for Bible teaching on tonight? The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice let all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice it trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and then all will see how great how great is our god age to age age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the god had three in one oh father spirit son the lion and the lamb the lion and the lamb how great is our god won't you sing with me how great is our god and then all will see how great how great is our God cause you are you are you are the name above all names and you are worthy of all praise yeah my heart will sing how great is our God you are you are the name above all you are the name above all names and you are worthy of all praise and my heart will sing how great is our god how great how great is our God won't you sing with me how great is our God and then all will see how great how great is our God oh, oh then sings my soul my Savior God to How great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to
maybe it's, we reach a, we reach, we reach with the, We greet you with the joy of the Lord. And uh, we'll be led in prayer by Reverend Priscilla Adams. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious, kind, and loving God, we thank you so very much for this very first night of our teaching for our revival. We thank you, Lord God, for all those who are here and all those who are on the way, all those who have tuned in by way of the internet. And God, we say thank you. Thank you, God, for sending a revival teacher to us tonight. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you would use Reverend Jennifer like never before. We pray, oh God, that you would anoint her with fresh oil from the crown of her head to the very soles of her feet. Thank you, God, for the word that will be implanted in us tonight. Use her for your glory and for your honor. Then, Lord God, we ask that you give us ears to hear eyes to see and hearts to receive and lord we also ask that you give us hands that do your work god in jesus name be thou glorified this night have your will and have your way and god we say thank you in advance for our very first night of revival thank you god that we can say lord send a revival and let it begin in each and every one of us so we close this by saying sweet holy spirit Sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. And for these blessings, we lift our hearts in praise. Without a doubt, we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. We have a tradition that whenever we are together, I do not tell children stories, and they do not tell adult stories. I'm gonna make an exception. Jennifer was like our family, born and raised in church. But one night, <clears throat> I happened to go into her bedroom when she was just a teenager. And I noticed that she was reading her Bible. And I said, Jennifer, you read your Bible? And she said, yes, Dad, I read my Bible every night. At that moment, I sensed that there was a special call and anointing on her life. And so, I am, when, when you grow up in a parsonage, it's a little different because you see not simply your, the preacher, but you see your father in his most difficult moments as well as in his moments of celebration. And I'm grateful that both of the children that the Lord gave Mrs. Watley and I are preachers of the gospel. From that Bible reading teenager has come Reverend Jennifer Maxell Watley, a graduate, Watley Maxell, a graduate of Howard University, Master of Divinity from Candler Theological Seminary, and now working on her Doctor of Ministry at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Co-founder of a church, the Breakthrough Fellowship, along with her husband, and uh, 
has her own independent ministry, Ellipsis. She is the author of two books, co-author with her father in uh, Like Father, Like Daughter, and has authored her own book called Ellipsis. And so uh, I am pleased and proud and deeply honored and humbled to present as our teacher for the next two nights, and our preacher, co-preacher for the third night, Reverend soon-to-be doctor, Jennifer Elaine Watley Maxell. Let's receive her. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. I bless God and praise God for bringing me here tonight. Um, if for no other reason, I, got, I could stand up here all night and talk about why I'm blessed to be here. But when I left my home this evening, um, I ran about a block and a half from my house and got a flat tire. Um, but God spared us and brought us, and I am eternally grateful. I want to say a special shout out to my husband, Charles A. Maxell Jr., who is right now at the car place dealing with the flat tire, so I could be here this evening with you. I want to say to your pastor, my pastor and father, Dr. William Motley, thank you so much for the opportunity. The one thing I know growing up in a preacher's house is that just because you're related to the preacher doesn't mean he or she has to ask you to do anything. So I count it a blessing to be here um, at my second home, St. Philip. Hey, y'all, it's good to be back. Some of you I have not seen since before the pandemic, and so it's just a blessing for us to be here um, together. So for the next few moments that are mine, I am going to teach from the subject, Thriving From Here, Living a Well-Cultivated Life. And the reason I chose this topic is because we've all been through a whole lot in the last four years. And I just figure since God has been good and kept us and blessed us, we might as well go on and thrive from here. Anybody with me? Can anybody say amen about thriving? From here, I'm going to open up with an invocation, and it is actually a poem from my latest book, um, Ellipsis. Let me get that. Um, and the name of the poem is simply, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. My Faith Looks Up to Thee. My Faith Looks Up to Thee, even as my brokenness weighs on me relentlessly rendering my call listless, denying me of joy priceless, questioning if I deserve this, discovering and experiencing the Judas kiss. My faith looks up to thee, even as grace and mercy defend me. Take the stand, reporting all the times they've been called to right my wrongs, to cast my misdeeds in the sand, to take my hand where they no longer define me. My faith looks up to thee, even as my eyes refuse to see beyond what others have done to me, beyond denying my complicity, oversimplifying complexity, with pointed fingers wagging sternly at those who have hurt me. Blaming them and punishing, dear God, I pray, heal me, forgive me. My faith looks up to thee, even as internally I struggle with duplicity, self-pity morphing into loathing, the contradiction seeping out of me, hypocrisy slapping me silly, even as I try to be pious and holy, instead of straight-laced and judging, lacking authenticity, recalibrate, Lord, my integrity. My face looks up to thee. In your eyes, Lord, I strain to see Compassion flowing freely, begging you to love me, take my shame and know me. Repair my heart, relieve my pain, restrain my sin, let me breathe again. 
Bind the enemy, break sin's hold on me. Reclaim my life, reaffirm my call, restore my joy, finances and all. Remember my name while on others you call. Catch me quick as I descend and fall. Give me beauty, Lord, for these ashes. My faith looks up to thee, clutching your forgiveness closely so it can seep inside of me. Mending heartstrings melodically, stirring repentance completely, helping me forgive truly, awaken to life restoratively, no more thinking pejoratively, but faithful, holy, and wholeheartedly, lightening my soul holistically, activating my call prolifically, making me release this pain, get off the cross, resurrect and breathe, live free again. My faith looks up to thee gratefully. One of the reasons why I chose to start this presentation this way is because we have all, like I said, been through some things in the past couple of years. And one of the things that I have experienced, and I'm sure some of you all have experienced too, is that this getting out in life again, this getting out the house, this getting out in the world, this transitioning to what will be from what was is hard. And even though the culture and the world tells us that we should just be over it, just be happy, outside is open again, just go for it, we don't really feel it that way. It's, it's strange to get up and put on clothes in the morning sometimes. We find ourselves moving slowly. Places that were familiar that we loved are hard to go to now. People that were there when we got there are no longer there. There's a whole lot of stuff going on right now that we just don't feel prepared to deal with. And so it's with this intention that I want to talk for a few minutes about what it means to live a well-cultivated life. What it means to live a well-cultivated life. I have some slides I sent over, so if, if you're able, if you could put them on the screen. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk about what it means to live a well-cultivated life is because when we talk about cultivation, the image that often comes to most of us is that of agriculture. We think about dirt and we think about soil and we think about what it takes to make good soil, right? And with everything that we've been to, I know sometimes it just seems like we're sitting here with a life full of dirt. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is how do we turn our dirt into the good soil that God can use to get the fruit that God intends out of our lives. Recently, I was on the internet looking up some information, and one of the things that I read was a quote that said, in one teaspoon of good soil, in one teaspoon of good soil, there are more living organisms than all the people on the earth. Think about that. Just one teaspoon. There are more living organisms than all of the people in the earth. That should tell us how important it is to make sure that we are living a life that is cultivated in good soil. The scripture that we're using today to ground these, this um, afternoon's teaching is Proverbs 28, 19, the amplified version. And you see it reads, he who cultivates his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless people and pursuits will have poverty enough. And so when we look at what it means to cultivate soil. The scripture tells us of the importance of this cultivation because it is through the cultivation of our soil that we are given provision, which is plenty of bread. And that when we follow worthless people and worthless pursuits, it leads not to provision, but to poverty. 
And while that sounds simple enough for understand, us to understand, I mean, we all grew up, right? As kids, you know, don't talk to strangers, don't hang out with the bad kids. The reality is that there are a lot of people who are out here who seem like good people. There are a lot of pursuits that seem like good pursuits. There are a lot of things we could get caught up in that seem good that really aren't for us. So the question we must ask ourselves is, what is a well-cultivated life? And I would like to lit that one of the characteristics of a well-cultivated life is a life that has been tended to, a life that has been stewarded or developed. And the reality is, is that some of us are just out here living life willy-nilly, right? Whoever shows up in our life, we accept them. Whatever happens in our life, we take it. Whatever somebody says to us, we assume it was meant for us and we should take hold of it and build a life around it. But what this scripture is telling us is that it is what we tend to that makes the difference in the quality not only of our lives, but in the soul of the soil of our soul. And so the question we must ask is, how do we tend our lives in a way so that the soil of our souls yields the fruit that we desire? And what do we know as Christians when we say the fruit that we desire, really what we're talking about is the fruit that God desires. Because as Christians, our wants and wishes and desires should always be aligned with our creator. When we talk about a well-cultivated life, we're talking about the language I just used, flourishing forward through risky, lightening our souls holistically, activating our calls prolifically, making us release the pain, get off the cross, resurrect and breathe, living free again, so that our faith could look up to God gratefully. I want to suggest today that we're going to do something a little bit different in the time that we have left. Instead of looking forward, we're actually going to take some looks backwards. And those of you who know me know I'm not a good transmissive learner which means for me, just listening to somebody talk isn't a great way for me to learn. I need to like get my hands in there, talk about it, pull it apart, turn it upside down. So we're gonna do something that we don't normally do in church. We are gonna talk to each other. We are gonna talk to each other. Mask on and everything, Whoever you're near, I'm going to give you some opportunities to talk to your neighbor and to share with one another. Because one of the things that I have been um, seeing throughout this pandemic is one of the things that we are all longing for is connection. And not just connection, me with you, connection, God with us, but connection with each other. And we don't want anybody to say they came to church tonight and nobody spoke to them and nobody smiled at them and nobody. So we're going to talk to each other tonight. Is that all right? I, okay, good. So I want to lift this quote by Miriam Hasna. You are not finding yourself. You are remembering. You are not finding yourself. You are remembering. Recently, I was um, reunited with a friend of mine who just moved here from California. She was the first person I met when I moved to Howard University um, back in 1998. And I hadn't seen her in years and years and years. And so she moved to Atlanta. So we've been reconnecting and hanging out and doing all these different things. And one of the things that has been a joy has been to listen to her tell my children about me as she knew me in college. One of the joys for me has been that she unwittingly has given me a glimpse into myself in many ways that I had even forgotten about. She's lifted things and she said, remember that time you said or did? And I'm like, I did that? I said that? I, oh no, I don't remember that. And so what that tells me is that for most of us, as my grandmother says, we've forgotten more than we remember at this point. And so we're going to go back and we're going to do some remembering as a way of God bringing us into a fuller understanding of who we are called to be 
today. Brene Brown says, authenticity is the daily practice of letting go of who we think we're supposed to be and embracing who we are. And so today, what I encourage, even though we're in the church, is for us not to give each other and talk about our good church answers, but to us to be really authentic with ourselves and with one another. You know how it is. Somebody says, how are you? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Everything is wonderful and everything is great. And you can't even wait to get home because your body is tired and hurting and somebody's got on your nerves and you've had a bad day. There is a value to us being authentic to who we are and the experiences that we have had. The first thing we're gonna talk about in this, guys, is identity. Somebody we're gonna practice. Turn to your neighbor, smile at them, We can tell if you're smiling because your eyes crinkle up, so if your eyes aren't crinkling up. Now, if you're not near someone directly, look across the way at someone or find someone to move closer to. Smile at them, tell them good evening, tell them your name. We got the mask on, so y'all might as well talk loud. If you're online, put your name in the chat. Say hi to your friends in the chat. We all friends tonight. Some of y'all still ain't smile, y'all still ain't look, but okay, okay. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're looking at this idea of identity. And we're looking at Jeremiah 1 and 5. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. In other words, I'm suggesting tonight that God's knowing, setting, and appointing is God's identifying, calling, and purposing. In other words, the key to who you are today isn't found in where you were born just by itself or who you were born to or the community that you grew up or where community you live in now or what church you go to. The key to your identity is imprinted in your body and spirit before you were even a thought. That God already had envisioned who you were supposed to be and what you were supposed to look like and what your gifts and skills and talents were and what your purpose for kingdom building and kingdom living was supposed to be. In other words, the key to knowing who you are in this case is remembering who God created you to be. Somebody look at your neighbor and tell them, remember, remember. Remember, remember who God created you to be. So the crucial questions we're going to interrogate is, who were you created to be by God? What is your true God-given identity? And who were you before the call of others, vocation, convention, brokenness, fear, ministry role? Who are you at your core? Who are you when nobody's watching? Who are you when you are at your most relaxed, most natural state? Because unlike some people who feel like who we were created to be has been corrupted by sin, I believe the Bible that says God created each and every one of us to do good things. So there's tremendous value and who we were before other people started telling us who we were, right? Before people started making judgments on the things that we said and did, before culture started telling us who we were and other people started trying to dictate and control us. Howard Thurman is my favorite um, theologian and, and I use his quotes all the time, but this one is particularly germane for tonight. It says, there is something in every one of you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine. It is the only true guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, you will spend your days on the end of strings that somebody else pulls. 
Can we be real up in here tonight? Can we be real? Some of us are dangling like a mug right now. We are dangling and bouncing on the ends of strings that society is pulling, that our spouses are pulling, that our children are pulling, that culture is pulling. We are not who functioning as those who God has created us to be. And so instead of continuing to kind of play this game and play the role and wear the mask, because you know what the problem is with that? Wearing the mask is exhausting. Having to get up every day and put on the proper hat, right? And put on the proper outfit. You know, I call it the upstanding citizen uniform, you know, growing up. So much of that is steeped in fear. So much of that is steeped in experiences that were harmful. So much of that is steeped not in our ability to hear who God is calling us to be, but to please people and to please others. So, so our goal is to quiet the noise and to get in a place with God so that we can hear the sound of the genuine within ourselves. Now, for me, I believe the sound of the genuine is the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. So when we talk about the sound of the genuine, when we talk about who God has created us to be, we are talking about the parts of ourselves that are breathed on by the Holy Spirit. So that's how we know that we are good people created for good things and not bad people as some people want to tell us because the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. So now for this next few minutes, we're going to do an activity. So y'all should be ready. I already told you, right? We're going to do an activity. So what I want you to do, I'm going to play a song. And while the song is playing, I want each of you to close your eyes, whether you're in the building or whether you are online. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to listen to the music. And I want you to think of a happy childhood memory. Let your memory flow back. If you are outside, I want you to feel the breeze on your skin and the sun on your face. If you were inside at your grandma's house, I want you to smell the smells that were in the air. Whatever it is, I want you to go back to a happy place and remember yourself as a child, just for a few minutes, just for a few minutes. Can we do that? I know this is, we don't do this kind of stuff in church, but we gonna do it tonight. You can go ahead and play the song. Slip your hands up for a couple of seconds. Remember how you felt. And just for the next few seconds, just create an atmosphere of worship. Remember what you Not thought. for any specific reason, but just worship them just because. See who was present with you. Come on, open up your in mouth. that happy childhood place. Feel what you felt. Whether it be laughter joy, excitement. Just let yourself go back. I hear you calling me, calling your spirit, drawing me. Now you can come on back to us. That's okay. You got the time to pass. 
So now I have a question for you. What did you think about? Who thought about something they hadn't thought about in a long time? Raise your hand. Who thought about people you haven't thought about in a long time? Places, right, you thought about in a long time. Now what I want you to do, we're just gonna take a minute to do this. I've warned you already, you're gonna have to talk to each other, turn to somebody next to you and share your memory. Now, I'm a qualify. We don't know to know every single detail. We only have a minute and that's 30 seconds for you and 30 seconds for your neighbor to share your memory with somebody else. Share your memory. Now the other person should be sharing theirs because I know some of y'all are long-winded. Okay, now how did it feel to remember? Did it feel joyous? Did it feel happy? How many of you are smiling underneath your mask? How many of you are smiling at, your, at the other person's memory and you may not even know them? One of the reasons why I wanted to do this because I wanted to reacquaint us with what it's like to daydream. What it's like to just let our memory float back to the good times. Because some of us do so much rehearsing of the bad times and so much reliving of the bad times that we forget there was even good stuff there to begin with. We forget that it wasn't all stress and struggle. We forget that it wasn't all strain and striving. We forget that there were people there who loved us and cared for us and took care of us. And we did laugh and we did run and we did get excited and we did have joy and we did have peace. And all of that is in our history and it is a part of who we are today. Now the question I have is this. What did you just learn about yourself? Did you learn that, you know what, I like riding a bike? Did you learn I liked being outdoors? Did you learn I like just sitting around with family, shooting the breeze, talking? Did you remember, you know what, I really actually did like pig feet, even though I say I don't eat them now. What did you think about? What did you remember? What is in your memory and your history that can be generative for where you're going today? See, that laughter, that joy, that cultivates good soil. When we remember the good things, when we remember where God has bought us, when we remember who we were, that's cultivating good soil. When we remember that God kept us even when we didn't have anything. When we remember that mama and daddy, even though they couldn't string two straight sentences together, they made sure we learned and did our homework. When we remember who we were, we remember that there is capacity. Tell your neighbor capacity that we have untapped capacity and identity within us that we don't even tap into. The question that I want you to take home for your homework and bring back with you tomorrow is, what can you learn about yourself when you remember who you were as a child, before you got self-conscious, before somebody told you you were not cute, before somebody told you you were never gonna be anything, before all of those negatives, who were you at your most innocent self? And we're gonna do some work to try to reclaim that. The thing though is cultivating, living a well-cultivated life is not just about our identity. That's one piece of the puzzle. As we talked about when we looked at the call of Jeremiah, that God gave us each identity before we were who we are. But that's not all God gave us. God also gave us a calling. 
And the problem a lot of times with when we talk about call is a lot of times we talk about in a way where people feel like if I wasn't called to preach or teach or do something like that, I wasn't called to do anything. But we are going to reframe that because each and every one of us has been called to do something that is essential in the kingdom. If we look at Jeremiah 1, 6 through 8, the scripture tells us, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. You see, the thing about this scripture that, that I love is the Lord says, one, do not say I am only. So whatever it is that you've been telling yourself, I'm only a woman, I'm only a man, I'm only a senior, I'm only short, I'm only tall, I'm only heavy, I'm only thin, whatever that only thing you've been telling yourself, God is saying, do not say I am only. Because there is no way that God can make anyone or anything that is only. Do not say I am only. Tap, put your hand on your chest. If you're online, put it in the chat and say, do not say I am only. It says, do not say I am only. For you shall go to all whom I send you and you shall speak whatever I command you. And so when we're talking about our call, what we're talking about is who are the people that God is sending me to? And what is it that God is calling me to say to those people? I remember when I, I first received my call to preach and I was like, Lord, is this really what you wanna do? Because, you know, unlike my brother, who's like, you know, the real, you know, conservative, nice, you know, guy, I was the wild child of the family. You know, I was hanging out and partying and ripping, running the streets and doing all that stuff. And so I was like, Lord, are you right for real? And I was talking to one of actually my little, my little sisters, she's like a mentee to me, my little sister. And I said to her, I said, yeah, I'm going to seminary. I was, her I was going to seminary. And I was like, yeah, you know, I might have a call to preach. And I don't even know why, because who would want to hear from me? And who would want to, and who would want to? And she said, actually, I would. She said, because you've done the kind of things that I've done. And you can speak the language that I can speak. And each and every one of us has done some things and been some places and had some life experiences and has an identity that will speak directly to somebody that me or Pastor Watley or Reverend Matthew or anybody else won't speak to. You're the one who God has called. You're the one who God has given the word. You're the one who God has shown. And the reality is some of us are people in our own family, people in our own community, people in our own neighborhood. It's so interesting. We talk about calling and the first thing people want to do is like go to Africa and like feed the hungry or, you know, they want to go to like another state and give out clothes or, and that's all well and good. I'm not saying any of that is bad. But the reality is you've got people right here. The very person you're sitting next to tonight could be waiting for you to speak what God has given you to speak. But we have to be able to walk into our calling. We have to be able to accept it. We have to be able to fully embrace that who I am is who God created me to be. You see, we were saved for freedom and abundance. And a lot of people don't want us to fully embrace that because there are a lot of people and systems and places that are invested in our being enslaved to their expectations. But when we are free in Christ, we are free to truly embody 
who God has created us to be. And the reality is for a lot of us, while we've been cooped up these last few years, we've had a lot of time to think about the lives that we have been living. And the reality is while we were cooped up in our houses, a lot of us got tired of our own selves. Can we be honest tonight? I mean, we ain't even gonna talk about our kids and our spouses and like roommates and stuff. We know they got on our nerves, but some of us got on our own nerves. Cause we fronting, we playing roles. We're looking, getting dressed up and trying to convince ourselves that who we're portraying ourselves to be in the world is who we are. When God said, I made you divinely inspired just the way you are. Who is it that God has created you to be? And who is it that God is calling you to speak to? And what are the words that God is giving you to use? You see, God gives each and every one of us a different language, a different vernacular to speak to the people that God is calling us to. And one of the issues that we have sometimes is that we are so busy trying to use all our big sanctified theological words that people don't even know what we're talking about. We're so busy being erudite. We're so busy being, you know, the pillar of the community. We're so busy playing these roles that people can't see that the joy of the Lord is ours. People can't see that isolation and loneliness is not of God, that we are called to be in community, loving one another. Just this week, we had three people who are popular who committed suicide. Young black influencers. Influencers are people on social media who have huge followings, like 37,000 people, 38,000 people. A lot of these people are making millions of dollars off of these likes and these communities. And yet people are dying of loneliness mental illness, they are dying of anxiety, and we have the cure, a relationship with Jesus Christ. But if we're waiting for them to come into these doors so we can tell them about it, we're going to miss them. It means when our grandkids come over, instead of talking about how bad they are and what they're doing in school, we need to make sure that we are telling them that God loves them, that a relationship with Jesus Christ is the best relationship you will ever have. When we're on our jobs, instead of looking at the wild youngins that are coming in and don't know how to act and don't have a good work ethic and, and talking about them and being frustrated, we need to introduce them to Jesus. And we don't need to wait till we drag them in here to do it. We need to introduce them to Jesus where they are. The reality is we have been called to be the church right now, right here, wherever we are. And the church is not this building. The church is the body of believers. And it is, an indicative, and it is imperative that each one of us walk that thing out daily, which means the people that are right in your in your sphere, the people who are right up in your house, those are the people we start with. There's a quote by Louis Stevenson, to know what you prefer, instead of humbly saying amen to what the world tells you you ought to prefer, is to have your soul alive. I remember a few years ago, Reverend Cam and I, that's my husband, you know, I call him Reverend Cam at, at church, but I don't call him that at home. Um, we had just gotten married, and I was doing my, you know, wifely best to make dinner. And so I had made, like, some barbecue chicken and mac and cheese and Brussels sprouts. And so we sat down to have dinner. And, you know, back then, that was before the, like, roasted Brussels sprout craze. We were just boiling them. You know how we used to do. So we're eating, 
and he's eating these Brussels sprouts, and he's like, this chicken is good, and this mac and cheese is good. He said, but I hate Brussels sprouts. And I was like, really? I didn't know that. I was like, truth be told, I don't like them either. And he said, well, why are we eating them? I said, because my mama said they were good and that we should eat them. How many of us are sitting up eating Brussels sprouts today? We grown, grown, got grown kids and grown grandkids, still choking down stuff that is not for us because somebody else told us that's what we should do. Somebody else said it was good for us, even though it was nasty to us. They said it was good for us, and so we took their word at it, even though it doesn't feel like it. To know what you prefer, instead of humbly saying amen to what the world tells you, you ought to prefer is to have your soul alive. And when we talk about thriving from here, what we're talking about is living as those whose souls are on fire and alive. That when we wake up in the morning, even though we got the aches and pains and cricks, our soul is alive. When we wake up in the morning, even if it takes us 20 minutes to get out of bed and get to the bathroom, and when we get there, you know, it takes us another 20 minutes before we can come out, our soul is still alive. Have you ever met somebody and, you know, you get to talking and they say, you know, back in the day, I was really something. I was a majorette at my college. You know, back in the day, I was something. I was the captain of the football team. You know, back in the day, I was something. I was valedictorian in my class. And you're looking at them like, what day and just how far back was that? Because, I mean, let's be honest, right? Time changes. Time catches up with all of us. But our souls are timeless. Our souls are ageless. God's divine power running through us, when we are connected to it, continues to keep our souls well watered and nourished, well cultivated and alive. And so the question we must ask ourselves is, are we living as if our souls are alive? Or are we living like we feel, right? Like, are we living according to the state that our body is telling us? Or are we really cued into that part of us that is still thriving and that is still living fully and free? Tonight, my challenge for each and every one of you is when we go home and you get in your bed to go to sleep, after you say your prayers, do your devotional, whatever your, your nighttime routine is, I want you to let your mind go back to those good places. I want you to let your mind reminisce and think about the places that you've been, the things that you've done that have watered and nourished and brought you joy. And then I want you to listen for the voice of God. Ask God to reacquaint you with who God created you to be. Ask God to bring back to your remembrance the truest elements of yourself and to show you where your soul is still alive. When we come back tomorrow night, we're going to do some other activities. We're going to go a little bit deeper, but that's going to be your homework for tonight. And whether you're online or whether you're in the building, I want you to be prepared to share with your neighbor what you thought about and what that experience was like for you. Can you do that? Can you do that? Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you tonight for your mercy and your kindness, for your covering, and for your creative genius in creating us. Help us, Lord, not to take your efforts on our behalf in vain. We ask, Lord, that you would affirm our identity, that you would affirm our call on tonight, that you would reacquaint us with who you have created us to be. And we ask that you would give us the boldness 
to walk freely and abundantly in that identity and that call. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Jennifer. Let's give her another hand. And we ask that we all get ready now to begin service at 730. Reverend Matthew, Reverend Jennifer, and other members of the pulpit staff, if you will follow me, let's make our way to the pulpit as the music ministry cranks up.
Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody. Won't you stand to your feet? We've come to magnify the name of the Lord. Come on and join us as we sing tonight.
next song says, Lord, send the rain, send a revival. And we're in revival. Now we got need God to send the rain. Come on and join us. The song says, I hear the sound of revival.
Send the rain, send the rain, send the rain. Let it fall for us only, God. Send the rain. We want you, God. We need you, God, to send.
the Lord has done What we've been waiting for Has come to pass Oh, see what the Lord has done Come on, will you sing with us? See what the Lord See what the See what the Lord has done. See what the Lord has done. What we've been waiting for. Let's come to pass. Yeah. Oh, see what the Lord has. Come on, will you sing it one more time with us? See what the Lord. See what the Lord. Yes, some of us have been sitting in expectation. See what the Lord has done. We've been waiting for, been waiting for, hallelujah, has come to pass. Oh, see what the Lord has
praise the Lord. We wanted to take this time out to recognize the presence of our youth and young adults in worship, whether it be in person or virtual. Come on, we can put our hands together. They're not safe in the schoolhouse. We don't want them in the jailhouse, so we should give praise when they come to the church house. Yeah. Amen. We just wanted to take a few minutes and speak directly to our youth and young adults and just encourage their hearts. And so, as I reflected and as I prayed as to what I should say, the Lord laid on my heart the words of the hymn, Revive Us Again. William McKay was raised in a godly household, but he went away to school, got caught up in alcoholism, pawned his Bible that his mother had given him before she left. She wrote his name and she wrote Psalm 51. When his addiction became so bad, he pawned his Bible to support his addiction. One day he got worried that he had become overly addicted and so he decided that he was gonna get right. He went to medical school and became a doctor. One day a young man fell off a scaffold, came into the hospital and he was about to transition and Dr. McKay said, is there anybody I can call for you. He said, no, I'm alone in this world. He said, but call my landlord because I owe her money and I want to pay her. He said, and tell her to bring me my book. When the gentleman died, Dr. McKay and the nurses were in his room doing the final paperwork and the nurse said, Dr. McKay, what should we do with his belongings? And Dr. McKay said, he has nobody, so give it to me and I'll dispose of it. He opened the book, which was a Bible, and he realized that his name was printed in the Bible. All those years ago, the Bible he pawned to get alcohol, how found this way back to his possession. So I came to tell our youth and young people and the young at heart that no matter where you go, no matter how far away it is, the word of God, the power of God can find you and save you wherever you are. Do you know what he did the next day? He stopped being a doctor went to seminary, became a preacher, and wrote 17 hymns of the church. Thank you very much. We greet you again with the joy of the Lord. Thank you very much, Reverend Joshua Stampley Gardner who is our yes. virtual pastor. Amen. Amen. And we are excited for this first night of the revival. We are grateful for those of you who have gathered, and we are grateful for those of you who are worshiping virtually. The church in this house sends greetings to the church in your house. Just a couple of persons I'd like to recognize when um, very few people know that New Jersey is the largest per capita state in the United States. The, United, the California has the most, but New Jersey has the greatest population per kilometer. Very few people know that uh, the state of New Jersey uh, also is the largest conference in terms of appointments. In the African Methodist Episcopal Church, there are 120 churches 
in New Jersey alone. And so New Jersey has a reputation for producing greatness. The only problem is, is that in these latter days, many of the Jerseyites are finding their way to Georgia. And so uh, tonight, let me recognize two of our good friends and former members, uh, Reverend George and Sister Pap Sibley uh, from Newark, New Jersey, who are now living in Albany, Georgia. Thank you for your presence. And thank you for the pecans you sent us last year. Let me also recognize, uh, in addition to our, our preachers, my mother, Mother Marion Watley, and uh, my companion, Mrs. Muriel Watley, for 54 years, and her friend. Is that Chip? And, and her. Her best friend, Sister Marilyn Washington, uh, who was a member of this church, and she was one of our bridesmaids 54 years ago. And I say this because we have four generations, and I tell our grandchildren not to ever take that lightly, that there are four generations of us living, not every family has a great grandmother, grandfather, parents, and grandchildren. And I am grateful for that blessing. And we're all clothed and in our right mind. And for that, we are grateful. We also would like to recognize those ministries who have been asked to come as I, I uh, call your name. Uh, jump up quickly as you can, sit down. Steward board, trustee board, stewardess board, New Life Ministries, church staff. Sister Morris, wait just a minute. Y'all stand up for a minute. Yeah. Morris Paley, I want him to see, make sure. Who? You're not on the staff, Reverend? Yeah, we're okay. All right, all right. okay. Uh, banquet ministry, media ministry, you all are working, intercessory prayer ministry, thank you for what you do every week, and church school, class leaders, and uh, anybody who's just glad, and this choir, and our musicians. It is a great pleasure for me to uh, introduce and present to some, uh, as I, I will not do to Jennifer and not do it for Matthew. We have an agreement that we don't tell children's stories and they don't tell stories on their daddy. But, but I will say that one of my most touching moments, I was raised that when you were when I was young, that and you got ready to go to bed, you shook the men's hands, but you were allowed to kiss the women. And so I grew up feeling strange about showing affection to my son. And then I decided that I would sneak in when he was asleep and kiss him good night. And one night, I went in to kiss him good night, and he threw his arms around me. And I said, Matt, I've been doing this for a while. He said, yeah, Daddy, I know. I was awake many of the nights you came and kissed me. And that kind of bond and affection and love has defined our relationship. And I am extremely proud and honored that the Lord has called him and that he has made such an enviable record as a pastor in AME Church. He built a 40, 448 million. 
$45 million church in the middle of the pandemic. And um, student, graduate of Howard, and then graduated again from Howard, and is now working on, has received an honorary doctorate from Texas, from Jarvis Christian College, and is working on his doctor of ministry at uh, the school in California, Fuller Theological Seminary. He is also an author. He is authored, he and I have co-authored a book, Poems of a Son, Prayers of a Father. And he has authored his own 50 Days of Prayer. And uh, we are so excited to have this team. Jennifer, who is teaching, and Matthew Lawrence, named after his two grandfathers, who is preaching tonight. We ask that you keep him in your prayers as he shall come rightly divide the word of truth. But in the meantime, what time is it? Then we give God praise because we have it to give. We believe that all giving begins with a dime out of a dollar known as a tithe. We also believe in the dime dime plan. Out of every dollar, the first dime goes where? Second dime goes where? We give God the first dime, we save the second dime. We're asking that you give a special offering of uh, $20 per night. I have my uh, check for 100 because I'm, I believe that a leader leads. A and so those of you who are gathered here may put your offering in any of the tithing baskets that are scattered around the church at any time. Or you may use any of our electronic means. You may give, you may mail it, you may cash app, PayPal, text to give, kiosk, online giving, or Givelify. Let us continue to worship uh, to the glory of God, this mighty <clears throat> um, let, I, I, no. Um, let me say it like we used to say it this mighty choir sanctuary choir will lead us in singing after which the next voice you hear will be that of the voice of God as God speaks to us through his servant Reverend Dr. Matthew Lawrence Watley hear ye him Yes, after you've done all you can. 
Let's do what the song said. Let's stand to our feet all over the sanctuary. Wherever you are at home or in the sanctuary, just lift your hands. Father, nothing in our hands do we bring. Only to your cross do we cling. We hold on to you, God, for we have no place else to turn. God, we know that you have the words of eternal life. And with all of the chaos and confusion all of the suffering and injustice in this world we have gathered in this place to hear from heaven we come with hands lifted and palms open to receive that which your spirit wants to say to the church we we lift our hands as a sign of surrender to acknowledge that what we're dealing with is beyond our reach is beyond our grasp is beyond our strength but God, what is too heavy for us is a light thing for you. And so we thank you for the victory that we find in relationship with Christ. We thank you that in him we are more than conquerors. Now, God, I pray that you might continue to speak and move and touch and heal and deliver. We believe you, God, for signs and wonders. We believe that you're going to straighten out the crooked places in our lives. We believe you're going to make the rough places smooth. In the name of Jesus, we believe you for healing and for wholeness. We believe you for salvation and deliverance. God, we believe you to do a new thing in an old place. So do what you have to do right now. But don't let us go until you bless us. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. It's in Jesus' name we want to say thank you. And all God's children said amen. Amen. 
and thank God. Come on, as you continue to stand, give God your best praise. Oh, I'm almost certain that's not your best praise. Like the Falcons one. Come on, give God your best praise. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. As we continue to stand, quickly grab your Bible. Turn with me to 1 Samuel, the first chapter. Meet me there in the first verse. 1 Samuel, the first chapter. Meet me there in verse number one. Reading out the New King James Version of the Bible. While you're finding that particular passage of Scripture, we do give honor to the Spirit of Christ, which is already resident and ruling in this place. For it is within him that we live and move and have our very being. I thank God for Jesus. For what he means to me at this hour, for his keeping power, I'm glad to be in the service one more time. Hallelujah. Would, would you all allow me a moment of personal privilege to salute and to celebrate the angel of this house, the one that God has anointed and appointed to serve as the senior pastor of the St. Philip Church. Help me thank God for my, my, my daddy and your pastor, Reverend Dr. William Donnell Walker. Yes, that's what the D was for. Amen. We want to thank God for him and for what the Lord is doing through him. We also want to salute and to celebrate the first lady of this church, my mom, Mrs. Muriel Lewis Walker. We're telling all the family secrets tonight. Amen. It's so good to see you out. And of course, uh, to the matriarch of our home, amen, Deaconess Marion Pauline Day Watley. We're doing it all tonight. We're doing it all tonight. Amen. To my co-laborers for this week, my sister, uh, Reverend Jennifer Elaine Wadley Maxell. Amen. So glad to have this assignment. It's the first time we've ever done this. So thanks for hooking us up, Dad. Amen. To each and every one of you, all the preachers in the house, officers, members, friends, and enemies of this church. I told y'all before, I believe every Christian church ought to have some enemies if we're about our father's business. So I know you're here. I don't want to be rude and not speak to all y'all. What's up? How you doing? Holla at your boy. I'm glad to be back here at St. Philip. And I'm certainly, let me just say on behalf of my sister and I, a word of thank you to this congregation, to the staff, to all who have been a blessing to support our family, to be a blessing to our father and our mother and our grandmother as each of them uh, has experienced challenges. You all have cared for your shepherd. And on behalf of the Wadley family, we want to say a personal word of thank you. I rest well knowing that they're in good care because you all are caring for them. And so thank you so very much. Amen. From the bottom of our hearts, we certainly are appreciative. And I know it's not easy. Uh, Brother Fitch, who has gone on to be with the Lord, every time I would see him, he said, I love you, Daddy. He's all man. He's all man. That's true, uh, Chip. I remember since we tell them, you know, stories. Uh huh. And never, you ever tell something when somebody's coming behind you with the mic? Amen. That was a strategic error. But I remember uh, growing up, and my father was asleep in the room, and I don't know what he had done that day, but he was just dog tired. I called him, called him again. He wouldn't answer. He wouldn't wake up. And finally, I went over and I kind of shook him. And I shook him again. And when I shook him the third time, he woke up and in one instant grabbed my arm. It would, I mean, in the middle of the night, his first instinct was to fight. <laughs> so I know what y'all are dealing with. I know he can't help it. It's just in him. So I appreciate your patience, but I appreciate what God is doing between pastor and people in this place. And it doth not yet appear what you all collectively shall be. Amen. Amen. Let me get to my assignment. First Samuel, the first chapter, beginning reading in the first verse. I'm reading out the New King James Version of the Bible. It appears on the screen, so I'm going to ask whether you're at home or in the sanctuary with the mask on. Use your outside voice inside. Come on, let's read collectively. Now there was a certain man of Rephamim, of Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. The son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. Now stop right there. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I was faking some of them names. <laughs> Here, can I help y'all church folk real quick? When you're in church and you stumble across a word you can't pronounce in scripture, just say whatever you want to say with confidence because I promise you the neighbor next to you, they don't know either. Amen. Just say it. Just say it like you know what you're saying. Amen. Next verse. I'm sorry. I've 
began to editorialize. Verse 2, let's read. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from this city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. Verse 6. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Thus far, the word of God. Y'all been so kind and cooperative. Look at somebody say, neighbor. The will say, neighbor. neighbor. Preacher's going to preach about. It's under my skin. <laughs> Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your cooperation. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord. So spirit does speak and God does guide. We just want to use this as a subject for the next few minutes. It's under my skin. It's under my skin. The goat, the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, is quoted as having said, it isn't the mountains ahead to climb that wear you out. It's the pebble in your shoe. I know he's right about it. My testimony is that in my life, it's not the big challenges that become my undoing. It's the little things that punch above their weight that have the habit of knocking me out. That that's the little lesson that I learned when I peered into this passage found in 1 Samuel, the first chapter. That the story is really simplicity itself. Reverend Mariah, the story is of one man who's married to two women. One man married to two women. Uh-huh. And it didn't work then. And it ain't going to work now. That's another sermon for another day. But, but, but just in that first line, we see the tension in the text. Because this man by the name of Elkanah is married to a woman by the name of Penina. And Penina, the Bible tells us, is very fertile and has produced both sons and daughters. He's married to another woman whose name is Hannah, and Hannah has produced none. Now, now this, is, this is important to understand because you do recall that, of course, at this particular time in human history, in this corner of society, the greatest aspiration any woman uh, could accomplish was to produce children. And so one appreciates the even greater tension in the text as now one has achieved her perceived purpose and the other has not. And what makes matters worse is that then the text tells us that, 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 that Elkanah had the habit of when it came time to bring sacrifice to the temple, to give to Penina and all of her offspring their portion of the sacrifice. But the Bible says because he loved Hannah, he would give her a double portion. One man with two wives, and he would give one wife double what he gave the other. Yeah, I don't see what could possibly go wrong. And, and, and as a consequence, the Bible says that Penina then went out of her way to make Hannah miserable. To, to use the parlance of the pericope, the Bible says that, that literally she would find occasion to provoke Hannah. You know, one of the things I've discovered about this journey called life is that it's one thing to have a problem. It's another thing to have an evil person attached to your problem to turn 
turn and twist the knife and add salt to the wound. Or more accurately, to add a grain of sand. See, what I discovered with a little etymological research is that the word penina, the name penina, is actually translated pearl. Let the church say pearl. pearl. And you know how pearls are created, don't you? P pearls happen when a grain of sand uh, comes into the oyster and the oyster unable to rid itself of this particular irritation then secretes a substance that ultimately is formed into a pearl and pearls of course are the only precious gem that come from a from a living organism but what's interesting is that of course if you know anything about marine biology you know that oysters are found not at the top of the water but they're found at the bottom so they live in sand so the fact that sand enters the oyster is not unique. The problem is a grain has gotten in a specific place. A, a, a grain of sand has gotten under the skin, if you would, and has become such an irritant that, that the pearl has to produce something to deal with what's up under its skin. I wonder if there's anybody here that knows what I'm talking about. That, that won't mind admitting in the sanctuary tonight that you've had some stuff. And if we can be honest, you've had some folk. Some peninas in your life that have gotten up under your skin. They've gotten to that place that provokes you and by, let me tell the truth right now if you just close your eyes and think about that individual your whole mood will shift if you just go back down memory lane for two minutes and think about what they had done and what they said and how they lied and how and it will bring you to a whole different mood to the marriage brothers and sisters it really ain't the mountains in front of us that are undoing it's the pebble in our shoe or the grain of sand under our skin. Who, who's your penina? But maybe it's your coworker that, that, that specializes in doing the least and tries to take credit for the most that you do. Maybe it's a constantly critical spouse that no matter what you do, it's never good enough. They always find something to, to pick with. Maybe it's a trifling child that that is grown just won't grow up and still looks to you to take care of them. I don't know who your panani is, what your panani is, but here's what I know. Everybody got one. And, and it may be sitting next to you on the roll right now. All I'm trying to get you to see uh -huh, is that Hannah is in this circumstance where she is being provoked so much that the Bible says that she now takes matters into her own hands. She has... A pebble problem she, she, she's she, she's got something in her life that just won't turn her loose she, she, she's got something that's gotten under her skin so that no matter even though she gets a double portion she can't appreciate she can't celebrate she can't enjoy the good thing because of this pebble that keeps on I don't know why y'all sitting there so quiet up in here tonight because the truth of the matter is God has been good God has been kind God has been gracious God has done exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think but when you fall down on your knees you spend about 10% of your prayer thanking God and 90% talking about your pebble and can I just ask you this question what if God chooses never to deliver you from your pebble can you decide tonight that if God doesn't remove my pebble I'm not going to allow my pebble to steal my praise that I'm not going to allow the one thing that I still don't like rob me from the privilege of giving God glory and giving God praise because of the 99 things he has done that I didn't even deserve him to do in my life look at somebody real quick and say neighbor I refuse to allow my pebble to hold my praise hostage if they don't change if I never get my way God has already been good enough to me uh, imagine the top of this bottle is a pebble 
Well, which is bigger right now, the, the bottle cap or this room? Well, it depends on perspective. Because if I take this bottle cap and hold it close enough to my eye, despite the enormity of the room, I can't see anything but the bottle cap because the pebble is obscuring. It is taking my perspective. It's taking its place out proportion and as a consequence I can be appreciative of the goodness of God, of the mercy of God of the magnanimity of God because I've allowed the devil to take me out of proportion <laughs> Hannah's got a problem she got a pebble problem but at least she got sense enough to take her pebble problem to the right place I feel like preaching just now Watch this. The Bible says that, that Hannah goes to the house of God. So she goes there because Penina's provoking has pushed her to this place of prayer. And, and when she wants to get to God, watch this, she goes to the house of God. Uh, I'm, I'm trying again. She got, a, she got something under her skin. So something that's wearing her down and wearing her out. And, and with this 911 need, she takes it to the house of God. I don't mean to go to meddling and messing in this part of the message, but can I just say this, St. Philip? I, I respect and I applaud and I affirm every individual that out of safety and an over sense of precaution is staying home and staying masked and staying away from people and staying shut in. I, I support you, I salute you, and I celebrate you. But, but for the rest of us who've been out, you've been out at the restaurant, you've been out at the mall, you've been out at the club, you've been out at the bar, you've been out at the game, you've been out at somebody else's house just super spreading everything. Don't all of a sudden get concerned when it comes to the house of God because you can't come. If you've been every place else, this is the only place in Atlanta I know where people are wearing masks. This is the safest place, so don't you use that as an excuse. It's time to come back to the house of the Lord. Come on, don't get quiet now. The, the, you ought to recognize that if you want something from God, it takes a sacrifice. It takes some effort on your part. It takes you going the extra mile. I appreciate the, the, the internet. I appreciate the fact that when I can't get out, uh, I can tune in. But don't let that serve as a barrier for what you're supposed to do, which is to press your way to the house of God. I was glad when they said unto me, let us get up out of our beds, put our clothes on, get in the car that God gave us with gas that God filled it up with and drive our hind parts to the house of God and worship him in spirit and in truth. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate the internet, but it ain't the same. It ain't the same watching as it is sitting in the sanctuary with the saints around when the word of God is going forth and the praise is lifted in the building. She went, she went to the house of God. Uh-huh. And when she got there, help me, Holy Ghost, she, she began to pray. And she began to pray. She began to pray in the sanctuary because she had a sense that there was something spiritual, something significant, something supernatural that would happen in this place. That all places are not created equally. That because this place has been consecrated, which is a fancy word for meaning dedicated, set aside for the honor and glory and worship of God, that when I come in here, I'm standing on holy ground. Okay. okay. Can y'all hear me? I said, can y'all hear me? That that's what it's like when I'm praying at my house. I'm praying and my voice is going, but it ain't the same. 
But when I come in the sanctuary, it's like what I'm trying to get to God is magnified. What I'm trying to get to God is increased. That when you bring your praise and you bring your praise, he says whenever two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in the midst and I'll magnify your effort. I, I was hoping for a greater response right there. It worked out differently in my head. Let me see if I can come for the young folk. Uh, it, it's like when you come into a place and you can't get no signal on your phone, but you're still trying to communicate. What do you do? You, you say, hey, what's the password to the Wi-Fi? Because if I can get the Wi-Fi, it don't matter Verizon or AT and Tripper, I can use the Wi-Fi in the place to get through. Listen, when I come in here and when you come in here, when you bring your faith and we bring your faith together, when we come together, we get a signal when I can't get through at my house, when I can't get through at my job, when I come in here. Here it is, Bible says, she went to the place where she knew she could touch God. And the word says she started praying. She, she started praying. She started pouring out of her soul is what the scripture says. She, she started pouring out of her. This ain't one of them fancy professional church prayers. God in whose presence our souls take delight. On whom in affliction. Oh, she was saying, Lord, I, I can't take it anymore. I can't take Penina troubling me anymore. I can't take I've been faithful to you and yet I've not been able to bear a child. God, what's going on? She prayed so hard, she prayed outside a regular prayer. Read your Bible. The Bible says she was praying, but she wasn't praying like people regularly pray. She was praying hard, her lips are moving, but wasn't nothing coming out. And when Pastor Eli saw her praying untraditional, non-churchy prayer, Eli figured she was up on that stuff she had been sipping so she'd have no taste before she got to church read your Bible and, and so he said listen stop profaning the house of God stop coming up in here drunk see see here's the thing you got to be careful about how you misperceive what somebody else is dealing with and what somebody else is going through and how you make assumptions about what they got to do to get to God you better hear what I'm saying because you have no earthly clue what that person had to press through. You have no earthly clue what they came sharing, bearing in the sanctuary with. You don't know how close they got to losing it this week. You don't know how close they got to a breakdown this week. You don't know how close they got to walking out this week. And so just the fact that they made it to the house of God, they may not act like you because they ain't going through what you're going through. And so rather than judging them, you want to celebrate and support them and let them know I understand I've been there. And in fact, I think we would be freer if we would stop having to worry about the church police coming to church. You know the church police. Every time you go to worship God, they look down the road. Every time you stand up, they look at you like I wish they'd sit down. I never understand people who come to church not to have church. Why don't you stay home? I I came to church, not just to have church, I came to be church. I came to magnify the name. You don't praise like I praise because you ain't been where I am. Here it is, Bible says, she started praying out of herself. And, 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 and Eli didn't know what was going on. He, he, he chastised her as she gave this uninhibited expression of faith. And, and notice the nomenclature of her prayer. Hannah prays, Lord, if you give me a child, I will give that child back to you as a Nazarite to serve you all the days of their lives. Now, now I want you to watch it real close. Because here's why I believe, watch this, you've got to get to the place of spiritual maturity where you learn to praise God for your penina. 
Okay, I'm gonna try that again. You didn't see that coming. Um, everybody praises God for blessings. But when you mature in your walk with God, you learn to praise God for the stuff that pushes you to a new place in God. See, every woman who did not have a child would have prayed that prayer, Lord, bless me to have a child. But because Penina kept provoking Hannah, because Penina kept bothering Hannah, because Penina had gotten up under Hannah's skin, Penina pushed Hannah to, to circumvent and to edit her own prayer. She didn't just pray, Lord, give me a child, but she said, Lord, if you give me a child, I'm willing to give that child. I don't believe she prays that prayer if Penina ain't been the pain she's been. So every now and then, you ought to learn to praise God for your Penina because your Penina has pushed you to a different place with your walk with God. Here's how David put it. It was good that I was afflicted. Who am I preaching to? Who, who, who learned how to pray and pray through because you were praying to get out of a sickness that doctors couldn't fix? Who am I preaching to tonight? Who learned how to pray and pray through because you had to pray for God to send provision because your check wasn't going to make it to the end of the month? I come to tell you every now and then, God does not desire a penina, but God will re recycle a penina and use what the devil meant for evil to push you to his purpose and his plan for your life. Penina and I'm pushed it too far so that now she amends her prayer request to God. Now, now here's what's interesting about the request. She's praying for a child only so she can be childless again. Lord, give me a child. And if you give me a child, I will give that child back to you. In fact, when you read the story, you'll discover it happened just like that, that, that she was able to have a child. And when she had weaned the child, she gave that child over to the priest to be raised in the temple to serve the house of God. And her only contact was year after year. She would come to visit that child when she came to make her sacrifice. And she would bring a little robe for the size the child now was. Can I tell you something? Spiritual maturity means that every now and then... God will give you what you want, but it's not necessarily going to work out like you expected. Uh, years ago, Jen, my wife and I, Shauna, we were, we were uh, vacationing in Europe, and I was all proud because I had put the plan together. Reverend Mariah, I had uh, done the itinerary, and I had found uh, this little uh, city called Metz, France. I had visited it once before, and so I wanted her to experience what I experienced. So I went online, and I booked the hotel, the best hotel I could find, and, and we drove over there, and, and it took me a while to, to find them. I found it, got the bags out, and, and, and checked her in, and when I got out to the, to the room, I went back down to go park the, the, the car. It took me a while to find the garage and to get that big car in that little bitty garage. And by the time I did all that, it was about 15, 20 minutes later, I got up into the room and I opened up the door and there my wife was sitting on a bed, bag still packed. And I said, baby, what's, what's wrong? She looked around the room. She said, this ain't going to work. I said, but baby, I showed you the pictures of a hotel on the internet before we got here. She said, I know what the pictures look like. But now that we're here, this ain't gonna work. And once Madam Queen had spoken, y'all know, brothers, what I had to do. I had to get online and book another hotel in another city. We had to go back down and check out because sometimes you can get to where you want, but it ain't like what you thought it was going to be. 
So sometimes you pray for the job only to get the job to then find out that all the stress that comes with the job, all of the responsibility that comes with the job means the job ain't quite what you thought it was going to be. I need somebody to talk to me. That, that you prayed for increase in income. You prayed for, for, for more financial benefit, but you didn't realize what Biggie was trying to tell you 20 years ago. More money, more problems, and that money started ruining some relationships and undermining some things that you thought were already established in your life. You prayed that God would give you a give you a spouse and allow you to have the wedding of your dreams. Only problem was the wedding went just like you wanted it to. Only problem was now you were married. I'm not hearing nobody talk to me. All I'm trying to show you is every now and then you can get what you want. But it ain't quite like you wanted it to work out. That that's where Hannah is. She, she done prayed and and here it is. I'm almost done. The Bible says that she prays and. And, and, and Eli accuses her of being drunk. And, and now she explains, I'm not drunk on beer or wine. I've been pouring out my soul for a child. And here's the part I like the Bible says. And then once Eli understands what's going on, he pronounces a priestly blessing over her. <laughs> and, and, and the word says that, that from that point, she leaves and she has a child. Now, now here's the part I want you to see. Hannah ends up having a son, and the son's name is Samuel. Let the church say Samuel. Samuel serves as priest instead in the place of Eli rather than Hophni and Phinehas because they had disgraced themselves in the presence of God. And now Samuel, the Bible says, God sends to anoint the first king of Israel whose name is Saul. But because Saul refused to comply with the word of God, the Bible says that God regretted, I need some Bible readers, uh, that he had made Saul king and therefore he told Samuel, go on and get your horn of oil again. Uh, and he went to Jesse's house and Jesse paraded all of his sons in front of him and Samuel saw the first son that was tall and good looking and said, surely this is God's anointed. And God spoke to Samuel and said, while man looks on the outside, God knows the heart. Not him, not him, not him, not him, not him. Samuel said, Jesse, don't you have no more children? He said, yeah, I got my baby boy, but I don't think much of him. That's why I didn't even bring him in. He's out there in the field. And, and Samuel said, well, he ain't going to even sit down until he comes in. And when he came in, when David came in, that's God said, that is the one. And the horn of oil flowed. So Hannah produces Samuel. Samuel anoints David the greatest king of Israel. David who serves in the line of Jesus. All because a woman named Penina provoked Hannah to pray a prayer she never would have prayed in order to have Samuel, in order to anoint Saul, in order to anoint David who would serve as the forerunner to Jesus. Y'all not happy. I'm trying to show you that God knows the end from the beginning and God causes all things to work together. That when something gets under your skin, God has the holy habit of causing that thing to push you to your purpose. Look at somebody real quick and say, neighbor, it may be under your skin, but it's pushing you to where God wants you to be. Uh, what Penina did produced a pearl. Somebody shout a pearl. And I did some research and I discovered the most expensive oysters in the world are called Coffin Bay King oysters. And because of where you have to gather them from, they can cost up to $100 per oyster. But I did some more research and I discovered that the most expensive pearl in the world is valued at $32 million. Which means while the oyster may be only worth this much, the 
pearl that it produces is worth this much. That whatever you are suffering, understand that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the pearl that God is going to produce, with the blessing that God is going to produce, with the purpose that God is going to produce. Look at somebody real quick and say, neighbor, it's under your skin, but it's pushing you to God's purpose. I've done what I tell you. I did a little more research. And I discovered after Penina had done her worst, after Penina had provoked Hannah, after Penina had provoked Hannah and pushed her to a place of prayer, you never see Penina's name again after verse 4. Y'all not happy. I'm trying to show you, you giving more attention to people who are not even still a part of your story. Stop focusing on your Penina and start thanking God for the pearl that Penina done produced in your spirit. Preach, Reverend. I'm done. Here it is. I promise. Last point. Bible says she went to the house of God. She prayed. Eli ended up blessing her. And verse 18 says, and from that point forward, Hannah's countenance returned. I'm going to try it again. That after the priest pronounced the priestly blessing, that, that Hannah got her countenance back. Hannah got her second wind. Hannah got her swag back. Now the part I want to shout on is the fact that her countenance was given back to her even though she wasn't pregnant yet. See, that's the purpose of praise. The purpose of prayer. The purpose of relationship with God. That I don't have to wait till I get it to act like I already got it. But once I declare it, once God has said it, it's settled. It's done. It's money in the bank. Look at somebody real quick and say, neighbor, Come on, say neighbor. I don't know how you feel, but I've made up my mind. I'm going to thank God now for the blessing that's on the way. I'm going to praise him now for stuff I haven't seen yet. I'm going to give him glory now because his credit is good with me. Who am I preaching to? Is there anybody here that knows that God's got more blessing than the devil's got blockers? Look at somebody and say, neighbor, I'm going to give him praise now because as I praise him, it lifts my expectation. As I praise him, it lifts my understanding. And the more I praise, the better I feel. The more I praise, the more my countenance is lifted. The more I praise, the more I lift up my eyes. Lift up your heads. Oh, ye gates, be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, oh ye gates, be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King shall come in. Who is the King of glory? He is. Yeah. 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 Everybody standing, everybody standing, everybody standing. Listen, listen, listen. I discovered that we miss our breakthrough because we don't understand what breakthrough is. Watch this, watch this. She prays in the sanctuary and before she leaves the sanctuary, her attitude has shifted. She ain't showing ain't nothing happened physically but there's a shift spiritually I need you to get in your mind right now that which has gotten under your skin I need 
need you to get in your mind right now that which you've been pouring out your heart about with God. And I need you to give it over to God right now in prayer. Go ahead right now. Don't, don't, don't worry about trying to shout. Just, just right now where you are. Just go to praying right now. Go to praying right now. Maybe, maybe it's a grandchild that you're interceding for. Maybe it's a financial concern that seems to be going from bad to worse. All I know is that you're in the place where Hannah was. You're in the sanctuary. You're in the place where your voice is magnified. You're on the Wi-Fi right now. Come on, go to praying right now. Come on, those online. I want you to go to praying right now. Right, this ain't no cute prayer. This ain't no church prayer. Out of your spirit, out of your heart, out of your soul. Pour your heart out to God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. Glory to your name. This ain't new, God. I've been talking about it in my house, but I came and talk about it tonight in your house. Come on, God. I need to produce. God, I need legacy. I need your purpose to be magnified and fulfilled. Come on. Pour it out, pour it out, pour it out right now. Pour it out. Pour it out right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you can hear us all at the same time. I thank you that as we describe our individual needs, as we describe our individual situations, as we wrestle with our individual paninas, God, I thank you that you can hear us all. And not only will you hear God, but you'll answer. And so God, I thank you for blessing. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you for healing. I thank you for provision. I I thank you for sanity. I thank you for strength. I thank you for new faith. I thank you for fresh fire. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you might stir up the gifts of your people right now. I pray, God, that signs and wonders will follow us. God, I pray for the supernatural. I believe you for the miraculous. I believe you that strongholds are being torn down and faith is being built up. In the name of Jesus, do it for our good and for your glory. Oh, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And it is so. If you believe that right now, give God your best praise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship him. Let's worship him. I love. I love Come on, let's worship him in spirit and in truth. I worship him. Just want, Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you more than you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. All over the sanctuary, say, I love. I love you, Come on, out of your spirit, out of your belly. I worship. I worship Just want to tell you. Let me just do this real quick. I give you the key. The key to, to Hannah's prayer was that she was not the only beneficiary. She got a child, but God got a servant. Can I ask you, is there anything in your prayer that God benefits from? I'm not telling you to try to play let's make a deal with God, but, but I'm suggesting that if there's something in your desire and something in your request that God can agree with, it's more likely he can send it to you right now. Some of us spend our whole time in prayer and God's never on the agenda. But I want to challenge you. I want to let you know that God's got more for you if you would simply align yourself. Let me give you some scripture. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of the other stuff you've been worrying about, he'll add it unto you. Come on, one more time. I love you. I love you, Jesus. I worship The door of the church is open right now. If 
if you don't have a saving relationship, listen, if you don't have a saving relationship, if you don't have a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm asking if you believe that there's a God in heaven, the devil knows there's a God in heaven, he ain't saved. I'm asking, do you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? If you've never invited Jesus to become in your heart and become Lord of your life, I got good news. Today, for you, is the day of salvation. There's another crowd up in here. You're saved. You're a believer. You're a homeless believer. You don't have a church home where you're growing and developing and getting stronger. I don't go to a grocery store with no food. I don't go to a, a, a church where I'm not growing in the spirit. So if you don't have a church home in Atlanta, I want to hear about a church in New York. You live here now. You need to have a church here where you're growing and developing. I declare this is a place where you will grow and you'll mature in the spirit. So on the count of three, I need y'all to help me open the door. I said, help me, help me, help me. On the count of three, your assignment is to go find somebody to ask them those questions. You're going to ask them, are you saved? When they answer you, if they say yes, I want you to shout, praise the Lord. But if they say no, I want you to encourage them and bring them down. Then you're going to ask them this question. Do you have a church home where you're growing around here? Not just where you're going, but where you're growing. And if they say yes, you're going to say what? Praise the Lord. But if they say no, I'm not sure. I don't remember. Tell them I'll walk with you and bring them on down. I need everybody to fulfill your assignment. Your assignment is each one to teach one and to bring one. So everybody, one, two, three, go find somebody right now. Ask them those questions. Are you saved? Do you have a church home where you're going? If they say yes, say praise the Lord. If no, bring them down. I'm not sure. Bring them down. I don't remember. Bring them down. Come on right now. Come on, my sister. I love you. I worship. I worship. Just want to tell Come on, don't walk out the same way you walked in. Don't be regret that you didn't move, but God moved on you. Hallelujah. Come on, one more time. We're waiting for you. God's waiting for you. The door of the church is open. I love, I love Jesus. Come on, you can make it, man. You can make it, sister. It's not too late. It's not too bad. God can turn it around. God can turn you around. Lord, I love you. Praise God for the message and for the messenger. Happy to see the uh, good friend of Reverend Jennifer's system of right, Donna, and this is Jennifer's godchild. Show you how this thing works. Who is now on the pulpit staff for Matthew, Mariah. Yeah. We pronounced the benediction at the last night. So we ask that you would be seated. Jesus.
This is a AME Zion pastor. Moved from New York. Feels that God is calling him to serve here. Want to thank him for his commitment. Want to thank you for the sister who was obedient to the word of instruction and who brought it. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may be seated. We'll pronounce a benediction at the last night and and then um, but we're going to end singing bless me and after we sing that everybody just do this I'm raving at the preacher but we respect the fact that this pandemic is not over yet and so we will dismiss as we normally dismiss respecting social distances after we sing bless me people to my left may leave that way to people to my right that door and those of us who are in the center may leave by way of the center doors bless me
At 6.30, Reverend Jennifer, preaching Reverend Matthew. You may leave now. Amen. No matter how it looks or how you feel, if God promises it's a done deal, Trust 